Welcome to the Small Business Tax Savings Podcast, your weekly dose of accounting and tax tips specific to small business owners. You will be on your way to growing your business and paying the least amount in taxes as legally possible. Here's your host, Mike Jezoshek, CPA. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Today, we have a special guest on. We have John Strohmeyer at Strohmeyer Law on to talk about something that many of you probably have not heard of yet, but it will be impacting you in the near future. And that's the Corporate Transparency Act. So, John, welcome to the show. Mike, thanks so much for having me on. It, you know, new requirements for CPAs and attorneys to be aware of kicking off early next year or January 1, 2024. It's going to be a big one. It's going to be impacting all of us, whether we form entities or just help clients report them. It's just going to be a big deal that we want to make sure. And, you know, I'm here making sure everybody knows about it now. Yeah, I love the kind of outreach that you're doing. And, and we kind of met through just some of the social media stuff that you're doing as well. So I, I definitely appreciate you kind of getting this topic and, and really being the front runner of, of informing business owners and, and those that work with business owners about this whole idea of this Corporate Transparency Act. So let's start there. You know, what what is the Corporate Transparency Act? What's kind of its primary objectives? What do people need to know about it? Sure. In a nutshell, starting next year, January 1, 2024, reporting companies, which is a defined term, meaning it's not going to be exactly what we think it means, are going to have to tell FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is part of the Department of the Treasury, about their beneficial owners, also a defined term, and maybe perhaps about their company applicants. Also, defined term doesn't always have the meeting we initially think it will have. All right, that's, you know, we're going to file a new return telling FinCEN about beneficial owners and the people who helped form that company. Why are they doing this to us? They're doing this to bring the U.S. into line with other obligations that the U.S. has internationally to report, kind of track money laundering and financial crimes. So this is following along with other obligations, you know, other countries have put on their own members. It is, yes, more reporting than we have done in the past. It is still less than a lot of other reporting that is done in countries like the UK. Uh, Mexico has more stringent requirements, more disclosure. What it's not going to do, it's not creating a publicly available database of these beneficial owners and company applicants. What it really is there for is law enforcement as well as tax enforcement. So just making sure the people who own things, you know, who are they? Again, the reason behind it, it's going after the bad guys doing bad things with their ill-gotten gains. What the regulations as well as the legislation tell us is, you know, when FBI and the other law enforcement agencies are going after money laundering, trafficking, things like that, they would find one entity, have to go to court, get a subpoena, get a warrant to go further up the line, and it just slows down how they are able to track funds. The idea is if they can figure out, all right, we know this one entity and you can then see other people connected to that entity, whether it's the lawyer who helped form it or you know just other co-owners, it speeds up their process of looking for, again, the bad guys doing bad things with bad money. Makes sense. And so, you know, for, for all of us out there, and I'm sure it's every one of our listeners that are doing great things, this isn't necessarily something to be scared about. It's just more so just a hey, we have a little bit more compliance, a little bit more forms that we have to fill out, so a little bit more complexities from that standpoint. Right. And what they're looking for, this is stuff that you should already have you know, pretty much well at hand. What are you asking to report about these beneficial owners and the company applicants? Well, beneficial owners, it's going to be their legal name, their date of birth, their residential address, not a PO box, not their lawyer's address, but where do they lay their head at night and call home? And then an identifying document, so like a passport or driver's license, as well as a photocopy of that document. And the idea is it's, or I haven't said this before, say it for the first time here, it's bringing KYC, know your customer, know your client regulations to attorneys and accountants. You know, just the same reason they do it at banks, making sure that you know, the bad people aren't doing bad things with their money inside of those banks. It's bringing it, uh, you know, to us so that we're not an avenue to help them hide the money. 
when Got it right. comes, yeah, when it comes to you know, reporting things about the company, again, it's basic information: your names, DBAs, address, taxpayer identification number, and the company applicants. So, me as the attorney who would help a client form this, they're going to want to know about me again: my name, date of birth, my business address, and then one of my you know photo IDs, driver's license or passport, plus a copy of that. This is stuff that. You know, as a person with not only a social security number, but TSA pre-check, a CAF number, a P10, you know, probably a few other things that I can't remember right now. Yes, it's one more thing to do. It's one more piece of, well, it'll be an electronic filing. It is one more thing. This, I look at this, you know, policy, the policy side of it, you know, this is the information they think they need to fight this sort of stuff. I don't know any better. And I, you know, I'll go back and forth on, oh my God, we're going to have so much work to do with doing the compliance on this. But at the same time, I look at it as when a new client comes in and says, hey, I want an LLC. Great. Until we have all of your information and it's ready to file, we're just going to hold off on sending those documents to the Secretary of State informing it. Like once you've got it, like we'll be able to nail all of your other, you know, your CTA Corporate Transparency Act requirements right after that. So you don't have to think about it. And until those beneficial owners change, or some of their information changes, there's nothing else to file. It's not an annual filing. It's whenever there's a new beneficial owner or something like that, something changes, that's when you make an updated filing. So, you know, again, it's probably going to be a lot on the attorneys at first, especially when you're forming entities. CPAs, accountants, enrolled agents need to think about this is we've got until January 1, 2025 for any existing entity. So any entity that's formed before January 1, 2024, they'll have until January 1, 2025 to get their initial report in. So that's not only the remainder of the 2022 filing season here in 2023, but you know, times where next year in 2024, we're talking to clients about getting their annual returns in. Like this is the chance for advisors to say, hey, while we're here, you've got a 1065 and 1120 and 1120S, whatever it is, don't forget, we need to get this return in for you. Either we're doing it, you know, your business attorney, your tax attorney, whoever it is, somebody needs to make sure this gets done. Mm, so makes sense. So, you know, just from a very easy concept of, of what's going on here is basically the government's just saying, hey, we want to know everything about the owners of your company. We want to know name, date of birth, address, an identification of them, of any entity that's out there. We just want to know that information. This is just another filing. The cool thing is, is it's a one-time filing, assuming nothing changes. So it's not something we have to remind ourselves every year that we're updating this unless there's some changes to it. But right. am I missing something there? So is it just the owners? Is it, you know What if we have a, a CEO that's not an owner? Are they have to do the filing requirements? What else is there uh, from a complexity standpoint outside of just saying, hey, I'm Joe. I own a consulting business by myself. Here's my information and moving on. Is there anything else that they need to be thinking about? Right. And so there will be some other people. This is where they're saying we want the beneficial owners. But of course, beneficial owners are defined. And it's not just, well, they start with people who own 25% or more of that entity. And there are calculations if you've got other things going on, options or things of, well, how much do we treat them as owning? We're going to put that aside. But people who are senior officers like CEO, president, general counsel, COO, people who have control over the entity, they're going to want to know about those people as well, even if they own 0.00% of the entity. They're trying to find the people who are in charge of an entity to see if there are those connections. The other thing, kind of the, the wide catch-all term that they're, they've are they got built in, substantial influence, important decisions. You know, the people who may not be down, but, you know, pulling strings in the background, these people also need to be reported as well. And you know, with, whether or not that means, you know, my wife, you know, because she has substantial influence over me, <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably not going to report her as an owner of the law firm. But if if there were... You know, the favorite uncle who has his thumb on how the board makes decisions, people who aren't necessarily listed on the documents, and think about who we're going after, the folks who are doing bad things with bad money. What sort of complexity are they kind of not putting their names down on paper, but really have the obligation to 
be put down as connected to these entities. Those folks are also going to get swept into, look, they want to know who these people are. Makes sense. And so when we look at this, you know, a, a question that I have is what businesses is this for? Is this mm -hmm. just for like those big operations, you know, people are doing a million in revenue or, you know, is there a certain dollar amount or is this literally for every single entity out there, whether you have 10 owners or you're just a solo guy that's got an LLC running your Uber business through it? Is it for everybody? Right. And so we'll start with who are the companies? The companies are going to be basically every company is going to have to file something. We'll talk about that something a little bit more in just a second. Is every entity... If you file something with your secretary of state to open or operate the business, it's triggering this filing. So limited liability companies, corporations, limited partnerships. You know, if you go to the secretary of state and say, here's my filing fee and a formation certificate or whatever it's called in your state, that's going to trigger it. What won't be triggered, trusts aren't necessarily going to be these business type entities because you don't go to the secretary of state. Sure, you may go to the probate court here in Texas have a will filed and you're filing something with the county clerk, but that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for actual business entities. Similarly, general partnerships, because you know, at least here in Texas, general partnerships are effectively just a contract between people. You don't get any limited liability protection from that. So you don't always think about that as a business type you want to open, but that's something that will be exempt from this. From there, Okay, well, John, you've just implicated every business that's going to have to go track down all these owners and officers and substantial influence and important decisions. Oh, my God. Yes, there are then a lot of exemptions, about 23 exemptions. Most of them have to do with companies that already have significant oversight from some other governmental agency. So mm -hmm. broadly speaking, there are a few different exemptions for entities that are filing something with the SEC. Again, the idea is the SEC is already looking at this. You know, the narco trafficker, the kleptocrat isn't going to kind of expose themselves to SEC scrutiny if they're using it to launder money. Other things, public utilities, governmental agencies, again, these are entities that are unlikely to be avenues for bad people with bad money. There are a couple other exemptions. One of the big one that a lot of people are going to be looking at, if you're a large operating company, what does it take to qualify as a large operating company? Five million in the prior year's U.S. source revenue. So again, look at your tax returns. What was the gross revenue there? That's what they're looking at. It's not just worldwide sources. They want five million U.S. They're looking for twenty full-time employees, again, in the U.S., and then finally, an operating presence here in the U.S. Again, it, you're looking at an entity that's big enough that it's drawn scrutiny from somewhere else, and mm -hmm. that will be exempt from this. Well, we've got these exemptions. What do we do with them? The instructions, the proposed regs on filing aren't as clear as we'd like right now. What I think, reading the proposed regs for the form, even if you're an exempt entity, you're going to have to log on, file your name and your TIN. And that seems to be it. And when we do that, you know, like that's five minutes. You know, you can almost set an intern, go look at our formation docs, talk to our accountant, make sure you've got our TIN right, and then spend five minutes typing that into FinCEN's website to just claim the exemption and just be clear, we're exempt, here's our information, and off we go. That's interesting. So, you know, we're, we're attacking people doing bad things with money, but if you make over 5 million and have more than 20 employees, then you're not qualified for it. To me, that's like, wow, you know, like that no, would be it's the other way around. It's once you hit that five and 20, like you're big enough that you're likely not the criminal enterprise they're trying to track. Right. If you're under it. To me, that just seems odd, though. Like, it'd be like if I'm a criminal mm -hmm. running a business, I'm like, oh, I just got to have $5 million in revenue and more than 20 employees, and I'm clear from this filing. But who, I, I understand the concept of, okay, you know, when you start to get to that size, there might be some other people looking at you. You know, you also have tax returns and, and things like that. So so there is some other avenues, I suppose. Right. Um, now, I guess the big question about this is, what are some of the repercussions from not filing this? 
And I'm just looking at it from a concept of if I was a bad person doing bad things, right. I'm probably not going to disclose my uncle Ronnie, who's in the back, not no ownership, no CEO title, but is really kind of running this company. I'm probably not going to disclose that. I'm going to try to get away from doing that. And so what are some of the implications for not filing one? And then what happens if, hey, you you forgot somebody? You know, they're not on the board. And, and, and it feels like there's a pretty gray line there of who has sub substantial control or, or able to influence the business. You know, the IRS or the government might look at one person one way and, and I as the owner might look at them differently. So what does that kind of look like? Right. So we'll start with the penalties. Uh, the willful failures are going to trigger $500 per day and, you know, national potential criminal penalties of two years in jail and $10,000. You know, those are for people who say, look, I'm not doing this or I'm going to intentionally misrepresent what's there. Yep. And it's important that it does have that willful. They've said, and of course, I'm not going to be able to put, you know, put my fingers on exactly those words right now. But when it comes to mistakes, they're looking at the, you know, international compliance of if there's an honest mistake, that's different. And so, you know, making sure there's voluntary compliance of, look, we want you reporting. If you miss somebody who's, who clearly is on the line, it's hard for me to say right now with, you know, zero enforcement because we've had zero compliance on this yet. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't start for, you know, what, 200 and some odd days because here we are in late June. It's going to be a wait and see. We're probably maybe this time next year, maybe we'll start seeing things happen. But I'd be surprised if we don't see, really don't start seeing enforcement of this until maybe even 2025. Makes sense. Yeah. And it just, it'll take time for enough data to build up for them to have that. Yeah. Okay, so brief overview. We have this idea of, of we need to file uh, starting January 1st, 2024 is when this comes into play. Right. If it's a new entity formed after January 1st, 2024, this would be part of just that regular entity filings when you're starting that entity up. If you already have an entity, so everyone that's listening to the show that is, we're here in 2023, you have an entity already. Once January 1st, 2024 hits, you'll have a year to file the requirements. And basically all this is, is letting the government know who are the owners of the business, who are some of the people that are officers of the business, important people. And if there's anyone that has substantial influence on your business, we need to report their information, name, date of birth, you know, identifying information, address, things like that. You'd probably qualify for this unless you're a larger entity or if you're in a public company, something like that. If you have a sole proprietorship, a general partnership with no physical entity structure, uh, you'd be exempt from from needing to file this requirement. Is that kind of a good overview? What did yeah, I that's yeah. The tweaks I'd put in there, uh, or kind of having talked about this, the things to think about those new entities. So the ones formed January one, twenty twenty four, and later, they're going to have thirty days to get that initial return in. Which is why I'm saying, look, if you're forming entities or if you know a client's going to do this. We all know clients do their best, but sometimes that compliance after the initial formation, it can be hard to get them focused. So I'm looking at it for my firm. We're not hitting send until we've got all the information to make sure clients don't get in trouble. It's like that. Mm -hmm. I'd rather not fight, you know, rather not have Vincent coming back and saying, hey, you, you know, you were a day and a half late. You know, here we, you know, we got our certificate of formation on Monday and we were able to file the CTA reports on Tuesday. The other thing to think about, and this is, I've been asked this a few times, for these existing entities, you know, the one that's been up and running for years, the reporting requirements go into effect January 1, 2024. They'll have until January 1, 2025 to get that first return in. What does that mean? What if we do something, what the way it seems to me and kind of reading between the lines, if you do a transaction January 5, 2024 for an existing entity, you know, kind of mix and match all you want. January 1, 2025, you're kind of, you're putting something down. So you don't necessarily need to report every iteration through 2024 for existing entities. It's, hey, if you're starting to think we may be making moves, we may, you know, do some gifting, we may sell something, may merge, who knows what it may be. Look at it as existing entities have until the end of 2024, they shouldn't be reporting throughout 2024, once we get into 2025, you know, it kind of the distinctions go away. Old and new entities, 
whenever there are changes, you've got 30 days to let FinCEN know about it. So if you, you know, if you're forming a new entity and then you're thinking, oh, well, you know, I'll list Bob and Sam as the initial owners, but really it's going to be Bill and Joe. Well, when you make those transfers, whenever something happens, Bill and Joe have to go down as those beneficial owners if they're coming in and they qualify. Yeah, makes complete sense. So this is something that's coming to, to probably most listeners on, on this show. It's something they're going to have to be coming up so to to start thinking about and getting this filing done. If they're anything like me, I'm just like, I just want to get out of the way. I want to do it now. And so, John, if I want to go now and just get this filing done way ahead of time, can I do that? Unfortunately, not yet. We are still here in mid-June sitting on proposed regs for the filings, you know, like the actual electronic filing. So it'll because it's FinCEN, it'll be an electronic filing. They have listed out here, this is what we think the form's going to look like. We're waiting on that final ruling to come out as well as you know them actually opening up the portal to submit things they've also said you're gonna have to wait until january 1 2024 to start filing which means for most of us you know we're gonna wait for a few more days the other thing to think about a lot of listeners here probably have calfs and p10s there's going to be a fincen identifier again that tracks us so we don't have to necessarily disclose business address or something to the company or, or residential address, if we're just not capable or comfortable doing that, we'll be able to get something where, look, you can go and update FinCEN directly. Now you, they've said in the proposed regs, you're going to go in through your login.gov, which is what I used to get to like my TSA pre-check account, which also makes me feel a little bit better about the whole enterprise of they're building off existing architecture and not trying to stand something totally new up. But you go in and update your information there because, again, we've got to report this information. If some of the information changes, you know, if I, as a company applicant, the, the attorney helping somebody file, if I change my business address, every company where I'm a company applicant has to file something new. But if I've given them this FinCEN identifier, just said, you know, John Strohmeyer, FinCEN ID 1234 or whatever. All I have to do is log in once. All those other companies don't have to file something. We're not triggering. Mm. Everybody has to go in and redo everything. And so this is where I look at it and say, the moment the FinCEN identifier uh, program opens up, grab it. It's just going to be easier because if your business address changes, you know, if something else were to change, you want to make sure that you're not triggering, you know, dear 185 clients. You've got a new filing because I changed my business address. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's going to be a bigger headache than any of us really wants. And so to the extent that we can get those FinCEN IDs as soon as possible, you know, definitely for advisors like us who may be going down as company applicants, for clients who are going to have multiple entities, they're, we're probably going to want them to get one as well. Just here, it, it's easier for you. We don't have to trigger a bunch of filings for you if you change your home address. Yeah, that's been super helpful. And, you know, I, I think that this is a good primer to uh, to a topic that probably not many people have heard about. And, and it's shortly around the corner. I know January 1st, 2024 seems like a long ways away, but uh, we all know as business owners how quick things move and it's really not that far away. And so, uh, John, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for kind of being the front runner and sharing information about this. First off, where can people find you? And second, if there's updates and changes to the regulations and when things start to come out, where, where where could somebody go to just find information about the updates that are coming regarding this Corporate Transparency Act? Right. Uh, to find me, uh, you can find, you know, one, my YouTube channel, Strohmeyer Law. We're putting a lot of stuff there. I'm on LinkedIn as well and Twitter. You can find me on most socials, either as John Strohmeyer or Strohmeyer Law. Uh the website for us, strohmeyerlaw.com. We are building out our own kind of separate dedicated website to this right now. It's just referring right back. But even, even after it's up and going, we will have, you know, kind of clearly marked at the top of the page, get your Corporate Transparency Act info here. In terms of official guidance, you can go to fincin.gov. FinCEN is going to be the you know, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. They have a banner at the top of their homepage that brings you right to all of the CTA information. 
Excellent. And we'll have show notes and a blog post on this topic. So definitely check out our link there that also will link out to John's stuff as well. So uh, definitely something to keep your eye on. We wanted to do this episode now just so people could start thinking about this and, and just knowing and putting it on their calendar, like, you know, make it a, making an appointment on your calendar of January of 2024 that you want to start thinking about this and seeing if there's anything that you need to be thinking about to get that filing done for your business. If you're a small business owner, maybe something, you know, share this episode, share this video with your accountant, with your attorney to say, Hey, just want to make sure you guys are on top of this. You're going to be taking care of this for me. Or if this is something that, you know, they expect you to take care of either way, you want to know who's handling this for you. So John, I appreciate you coming on. It's been a pleasure. And uh, like I said, we'll have a link show notes everything that's kind of linking back out to everything uh, for more information on this. So John, thanks for coming on. Mike, thanks for having me. This has been another episode of the Small Business Tax Savings Podcast. If you enjoy our weekly episodes, please leave a review and share with other business owners. You can find previous episodes and more information at www.taxsavingspodcast.com. Thanks for listening and have a great day.